Hello and welcome to another episode of Cherishing Scripture Podcast. My name is Jeremy Boggs and I'm here today with my two co-hosts, Zach Taylor. He's our youth director here in our church and our pastor, Pastor Brad Bailey. We're so glad that you can tune in with us to Changing Society by Cherishing Scripture. You can do your part in this mission by uh, leaving us a like, comment, and subscribe if you're on YouTube or if you're listening on any other platform. If the option is there to leave some kind of review or some kind of uh, star rating, we would so appreciate if you would do it. Also, share this episode with anybody. The best way to change society by cherishing scripture is to spread the truth, spread God's word. And that's what we're doing here. We love God's word, but we're not doing this to get our name known. We're not doing this to become popular in the podcast world. We're just doing this because we love God. We love our King. We love his word and we want his word to be spread. And if you've enjoyed so far this little series in Galatians we've done, you can visit our church website. All Galatians sermons that our pastor has done on Wednesday nights are there. I'll link that in our description. And if you have enjoyed, again, our podcast, podcast on Galatians, email us. We'd love to hear how much it's maybe an eye-opening experience or maybe it's helped you gain more knowledge in this area of liberty in Christ. And if you just enjoyed this series, email us, cspodcastcrew at gmail.com. Again, that email will be in the description, cspodcastcrew at gmail.com. If you have your Bibles, open it up to Galatians chapter 5. We'll be getting in verse number 7 and making our way down through verse 10. So beginning in verse 7, Paul says, Ye did run well. Who did hinder you? You that sh- that that ye should not obey the truth. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have no, com- excuse me, I have confidence in you. I think I ate the same lasagna, right? <laughs> yeah. I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. So this fifth chapter, man, this is the one. This is where he really brings it right down to the cutting edge and, and deals with the fact that we have to take a stand for our liberty. That was last time. Uh, verse number one, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And then he jumps in this one and he kind of gets nostalgic with them. He wants them to remember how they ran well. Verse seven, uh, you did run well. I think they had a good beginning. I think they had a good Definitely start. past tense. There's no arguing that. Yeah. They did yeah. run well. But, but his th- concern is still there. There's still trace of of his burden, you know, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth. So that's pretty strong because if it's, if it's not the truth, it's the lie. And right. that's where he's he's really calling in the task, you know, what happened? What happened to you? Why are you this way? Man, I'd love to ask some people that question. Yeah, I would yeah. love to get that <laughs> answer. Is. What happened to you, man? What? Why is your church this way? Why, why are you, uh, you know, why are you so far off in left field on this particular subject or this matter? I think it comes down to an, the intoxicating addicting nature of external sanctification and comparing yourselves among yourselves. I know today that seems to be a lot of the issue for them. Uh, who and what hindered you? That's talking about the Judaizers. You know, for the Galatians, he's talking about the Judaizers here who are dragging them back into a uh, an excessive emphasis on Old Testament law. And then on top of that, I got a question for you, Pastor. Um, yeah, you're a very good student of the Word. Is there any place in the Bible where legalism isn't mentioned as a hindrance? Not that I'm aware of, you know. I mean, we have the probably some of the most emphasized portions of Scripture dealing with the matter of legalism is among the Pharisees. And I can't find one positive thing Jesus had to say about the Pharisee. I can tell you this. He loved harlots. He loved sinners. He loved tax collectors and publicans. He loved centurions. But he had virtually no affection whatsoever for the Pharisees. He loved them, loved, loved their soul. But Jesus saw the danger of this externalism. He saw the danger of it. And I think people need to understand we're not here we're not trying to pick fights because here's the truth jesus he said stuff to the pharisees he rebuked the pharisees but at the end of the day he ended up focusing on the ones that needed to be focused on for us people that are set in their ways and convinced that what they're doing is right so be it they can they can live that life of bondage um but we're more so talking to the people that can need to realize that this isn't the christian walk uh don't don't be hindered uh, as paul mentions here jesus had the foreknowledge you know to know if these people were going to repent i think we could probably safely say, you know, that he was aware who was going to join the cause or who was going to stay the course and be a, a, you know, just a slash and burn Pharisee their whole life. So I think those are the ones that he basically cut them off at the knees. We we do have Nicodemus, you know, where John chapter 
chapter 3, came to Jesus by night, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou dost except God be with him. So Nicodemus, we know, rejected on that occasion, but later embraced Jesus. Mm -hmm. We find him at the cross, you know, taking the body of Jesus with Joseph of Arimathea, taking it to the tomb. So can a Pharisee be saved? Yes, they can. Uh, Is it likely that they will? Not so likely, because they're so blinded by their worldly religion. And that's what begs the question here, you know, what happened, man? Who hindered you? What turned you sour? You know, what what got you in this uh, in this false way? I think it's authority and power that yeah. I, I, I did that. I was thinking about the same thing. I just thought about it. I was read uh, earlier this week in John where uh, that blind man, Jesus healed the blind man. He spit and made clay and told him to go wash. And then uh, the all those Pharisees and scribes and priests were questioning him and kept saying, you know, are you sure you did this? And, and they just kept saying, questioning, 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 and who did it? And um, Jesus came in and kind of knocked their own authority out from underneath them. Yeah. And said, and came in at like a big brother and stood up for him and said, "Yeah, we, I did this." And uh, it was just when you have when you want it your own way, um, it seems like nobody else matters. And you know the the thing with that too, you know, you're making that illustration, Jeremy, about Jesus, you know, healing this blind man and these other people. You know, there were occasions where he did that on the Sabbath, and that's when that really you're talking about raising the ire, buddy. They really got upset. So their whole concept was, we would rather this man have stayed blind. I mean, seriously, we would have rather this person stayed lame. And that same thing happened. Then with you have the, done this on the hand. Sabbath. Man with yeah. the withered hand. He, and it says yeah. Jesus actually got frustrated with them. Yeah. Because yeah. why? Because they don't care about healing. They just care that you did that on the Sabbath. Well, we'd, rather this man, we'd rather this man remain a beggar or die prematurely than he you have healed him on the Sabbath. To him. He said, which one of you, if your sheep fell in the ditch on exactly. the Sabbath, wouldn't go retrieve it? Isn't yeah. that the same blind man or is it a different blind man where he picked up the bed and they got mad at him for carrying the bed? On the Sabbath. On the Sabbath yeah. day. Well, you know, there was the lame man. He said, rise, take up your bed and go into your house. And when they saw him carrying his bed on the side, they were like, hey, wait a minute. Who told you you could do that? Yeah. You know, you're violating the customs of the of the Pharisees. Who told you you could do that? And then he said, well, Jesus told me to do it. And they were just furiated that Jesus was giving people to do things with liberty mm-hmm. that they had taken away. And yeah. that's the goal, purpose, and modus operandi of a lot of people. They want to take away your liberty. It's Paul and Peter in conflict here where Peter is spying out your liberty. And, and, uh, and he is, in some cases, they're jealous mm-hmm. of your liberty. And they're like, look, if, if I can't be happy, you can't be happy either. Yeah. And didn't they exactly? A lot of those, the law, the like this, like the oh, Sabbath, man, are you like kidding? you can't pick up more than this on the Sabbath. Yeah. I'm wondering what they Couldn't were saying. Pick up more than a dried fig. Yeah. Now, question, because I had a friend of mine. He's an interesting character, to say the least. Uh, but he was telling me that he's a pretty intelligent guy. But he was telling me that a lot of the Pharisees didn't even read the Torah as much. They more so read the Talmud. Right. Do you know much about that? Well, the Torah, With- the Torah was the, you know, it encapsulated the first five books of the law. You right. know, we would call the Pentateuch, but the Torah was more, uh, how would you say this? It was more It was more concrete scripture. Talmud served as kind of a commentary, and it wasn't just a commentary, it was a running comment, you know? Right. I mean, it's like an editorial. Because he, you know, he said this and, week in the Talmud, you know, and it's this totally... I've never studied the Talmud personally, but he said that it originated when Moses was up on Mount Sinai, is when it actually yeah, I don't know about started. That. I don't know. It could. I've, I've never looked at that concept, but I can tell you I've read the Bible a while what happened on Sinai, and I don't read anything about the Talmud there. Yeah. You know, it is the, you know, it does emphasize the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, you know, so there may be some connection, uh, or at least they feel like there may be some connection there. I'm not totally, totally sure. Problem is verse 8, right, because it really, oh man, you talking about a low blow. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. So him that calleth you is a New Testament church epistle reference to God. What does it say? Uh, Romans 8, 28. Um, goodness, my mind's drawing a blank. Uh, All things work together for him that loveth God to him who is the call called according to his purpose uh, the called or him that calleth you it's all it's synonymous with salvation and so it's talking about god here him that calleth you is a reference to god and so he basically tells them in verse number eight this is not of god hmm. this persuasion that you have that's a great word by the way persuasion there uh it's a uh, a, a word that basically means credulity or it's referring to the to the you know to convincing truth this persuasion that you have what you've convinced
convinced yourself of, you think this is of God, it's really not, is the death blow. I mean, here's the apostle saying, this is not of God, this is of man, this is spawned maybe even of Satan. So he hits him pretty hard uh, in verse number eight, this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Yeah. If it's not of God, who is it then? I, I've been wanting to preach an old message on was that God or not? You know, we see these guys beating the drum of sanctification, carrying on about sanctification, the separation, and all this kind of stuff. And all of a sudden we find out the whole time they're having an affair on their wife. You know, okay, was that God or not? Yeah. That preaching that you were doing, you know, where you're slamming people and calling women names and all that kind of, was that God or not? Mm. Got a guy right now, <laughs> got a guy right now in the state of Tennessee, one of the biggest opponents of, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, you know, th- those of us who are standing fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. This guy's really made a project of, historically, he's really made it made it his goal to expose and to condemn and to, to slash and burn every all of us, you know. So, yeah, okay. All right, now we find out he's been sending, uh, you know, nude pictures of himself to women and underage girls in his church. Wow. And he goes, uh, when, and when he gets caught, somebody outs him. He gets caught. So then he goes to these women and girls and says, hey, I'm in big trouble if you don't delete those from your phone. I look, I don't know where you're from, but uh, in the United States, that's tampering with evidence. Yep. And, you know, he's telling them to delete this information from their phone. So what does he do? He cashes out of his church, goes on the run, and to this day, they can't find him. Wow. So I'm wondering, was that God or not? You know, all that sanctified preaching, all of that emphasis on externals, all that stomping and screaming and yelling about, don't go liberal, don't be, don't exercise liberty, don't, you know, and there's a new term, you know, um, you know, that some of the guys on on that side of, are coining these days, you know, about uh, newfound liberties. They're calling it our newfound liberties, and they're saying, you better be careful. You're going to do this, and you're going to do that. And a lot of times, these guys are were finding out things about them that nobody wished we'd have found out. Was that God or not? And Paul says in verse number eight, it wasn't God. Mm-hmm. Cometh not of him that calleth. I'm not going to lie. I actually kind of, I enjoy it for a, like a comedic purpose. I actually enjoy kind of watching them rant yeah. and rave about stuff. Yeah, the IFB sermon clips. Oh, and all yeah. Stuff. Like Miss Shay sent me one of a yeah. preacher's uh, sermon. His whole sermon at a college was how women need to go to the altar. Yeah. And it's like, it's always a woman. It's like, <laughs> okay. I'm glad I got nothing out of that. The sermon notes, man. Yeah. We were playing, I'll tell should. you a funny story. We were playing ball one day at camp. Oh, man, this has been pff, at least 12, 14 years ago. And um, <laughs> we were pretty rock rib, right wing people ourselves back then. We had this guy preaching for us. And his favorite cliche, you know, is oh, it's always a woman. You got a problem in the church, it's always a woman. If you got a, a sinner in the church, it's always a woman. You know, so he was carrying on, carrying on about this, you know. And sometimes it was comical. Sometimes he was trying to be funny. But, you know, there was a, you know, even our comedy is betraying the truth sometimes. Much is said in jest. Yeah, exactly. So he's carrying on about this. It's always a woman, always a woman. So one day we were playing softball. We happened to have this girl there camp this year. And uh, she, nobody knew this but me, but she was like an all-star softball player, Hmm. you know. So she's on the opposite team of this preacher. And he thinks he's a hot shot, you know. So he gets up to bat. He's gripping his bat, you know, getting ready to swing big and, you know, go for the fences and this and that. So pitch comes across the plate. It's pretty good pitch. You know, he nails it. Line drive straight over the second baseman and uh and this girl is out there playing center field and she just darts up to the ball catches it like a major league baseball pro mm. and um, it catches him out and then the base runner who had run off of first base she throws that base runner guns out at first guns him down and uh and so this guy's wife this preacher's wife yells out from the stands hey it's always a woman isn't it it's always a woman you know <laughs> just just need Killing him, you know, and giving him a hard time, you know. But sadly, you know, I mean, ladies have a lot of times been on the short end of uh, a lot of criticism and a lot of a lot of terrible treatment, you know. And some of those sermon clips, yeah, you can see the. But we really know it's a man's issue. It. Yeah, it always every starts, issue is a man. It always issue, starts right? with the man. What was Lot's wife' problem? It was Lot. Mm-hmm. Was, I saw one that was, was Sarah's problem. It was Abraham. One that was pretty funny. To me, a preacher was like, um, "It said uh, now they have they don't have song leaders. They have worship leaders. Guys up there, tight pants with their jiffy lube hairdo." And then he said um, something along the lines of, he said, and they have backup singers, one one Asian, one Mexican, Terrible. one black. How could he get white. away with that, 
man. And I'm like, did he just say this? And people were like, hey, man, hey, man, preacher, hey, man. And I'm like, good. You know why? He's like, and they got britches on. Yeah. You know know how they can get away with it? They don't pastor in Tampa. Yeah. Yeah. That's why. When you pastor in Timbuktu, West Virginia, and you're still churning butter up there, you can get away with making comments like that in your town, but you're not going to say that in Tampa, Florida. Mm. You know, that's an offense to the gospel and the sensibilities of people. If I had said that this morning in our church, man, they'd have burned this place down. And people look at that and they're like, well, you can't preach on anything then. No, I just have a brain, yep. you know? I mean, I'm not, I don't want to preach that you just garbage. Can't well, I don't, I don't get <laughs> yeah. why. It's not even preaching. <laughs> yeah. My thing is, and I've said this before, and I don't mean make an application from the Bible, but find a Bible verse and preach it. And if you can find that verse and you can preach on your standard, then I will agree to it if that's what the Bible is really saying but a lot of these things they can't find bible for no, and no ultimately like i said and like paul said here it's a hindrance it that's all hindrance. it is and that persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you i mean that's the that's the nail in the coffin here man that like, is not of my God. question to people is when you got saved did christ compel you not to go to the movies or did christ compel the lady not to wear pants or was it because some preacher got up there and for 45 minutes he just embarrassed you about going to the movie theater yeah. and told you that you're wicked and you're a sinner if you go it, it goes back to that emotional preaching. And it, you know it really what? Keys hey, in I mean, look, let's be balanced. There's some movies you don't need to go see. Right? Yeah, that's you know, true. There's some stuff you do need to, you need, you need to show some dis- Yeah, and I agree with that. Discretion. But don't say don't go wisdom. to the movie theater and then watch it at home. Exactly. That's I never understood that. Exactly. That. I never got that. Yeah, I mean, here's the other thing, too. You know, they're like, oh, you can't watch movies. You can't watch movies, but they watch UFC. Yeah, right. My favorite you one know? is you can't. they're sitting there gawking at these ring girls, you know, barely have any clothes on, walking around the ring with their card up, you know, round two, round three. And I'm like, man, don't talk to me. Yeah. Don't talk to me about your sanctification. You're watching the UFC and you're watching these ring girls, man, with barely enough clothes on to cover up one leg of a grasshopper. And you're telling me that's sanctified. I don't want to hear that. Yeah. My favorite one is you can't have a TV in your home, but you'll watch the game on your phone. Yeah. That's my favorite one. I know somebody that said that did that. He said, you can't have a TV um, and preached against it. It was totally against it, but he would go home and watch it on his phone. What's the difference? And I can tell you this right here. It's not the truth. You can get into 10 thousand times more trouble on your phone than you would on your television. Yeah, you can. And here's because the these phones Promise track you. can do everything. For people that have... Of course they can. They for can people track. that have been saved a little while, uh, for them, you know, it can be... Um, they can kind of brush the stuff off like, okay, th- we know this isn't true. Like, uh, sometimes a preacher comes in and says something that you know is not necessarily Bible. You can just kind of, you know, like wipe it off and let it go. But the people that it really affects and the people that it really hinders are the new believers, the new converts, right. the yeah. ones that are like, man, I didn't know this. Like, well, if going to the movies is a sin and they just got saved last week, they're going to cut everything out of their life. They're going to be so miserable. And then what's going to happen is they're just going to revert back to the old way. Gonna get disenchanted. That's why a lot of them are turned away from yeah, it. That's they, verse nine, by the way, a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. They think it's just a list of do's and don'ts, but the Christian life is not a list of do's and don'ts. It's about living your life knowing that your sins are paid for and right. that you don't, there's not, you don't have to do anything. Christ did it all for you. Yeah. And there's a lot right. of things I don't do, but it's not because I can't can't because I don't want to. Yeah. Right. And that's well, the and difference. some things are just common sense. Like, I still have the capability to look at inappropriate images, sure. but I don't want to. Yeah. Sure. So I don't have to. We're all 21 years old. We can all go out and get slammed and drunk this afternoon legally. Legally, but I don't want, want to. to. But I don't want that's to. That's the point. And, and that's the thing. I didn't, Pastor Ailey never had to get up and say, well, you can't drink if you're a Christian. Mm-hmm. That was something that I got saved. Some things are I, better said by the Holy Spirit. Yes. Right? right? I mean, why do I have to control every part of your life? Is isn't there some things that the Holy Spirit can obviously say better than I can? Mm-hmm. Right. And if it's a preacher, my thing is, if it's a preacher, a preaching expositionally, and he goes through Matthew and he gets to a point where it preaches about this, then I'm okay with it. These preachers that are just getting up there and preaching a sermon in a different book every week so they can preach on a you know a, a certain issue that they have, an acts they're wanting to grind, so to speak, then I, I'm like, you're not even preaching expositionally. No. Yeah. But all these standards, in some cases, are just irrelevant because when, when Christ or when God looks at us, he doesn't see circumcision. But what does he see? He sees Christ. He doesn't right. see what I'm wearing. You're either saved sees, or lost. Right, right. Not, and, and you should be modest and you should wear clothes, but uh, God's not going to sit there. And all he, all he does is he just sees Christ. But it goes back to application. Right. Like we were talking about this. Let's not just talk about, you know, like you talked about Nigeria today and those women, but think about we have a huge homeless ministry yeah, here. Kenya. Are you telling me that women that get saved on the streets need right. to now wear a skirt on the streets? 
Right. How right. dumb is that? That's just dumb. It, does, it literally makes no sense to me. It's exactly right. <laughs> so a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump, they basically, you know, here's the thing, you know, I could come to our church any given weekend and start beating this drum and start saying things like, okay, look, uh, I have discovered that it is a sin for a lady to change the color of her hair. If I stood up and I'm just using that as an example. It's a sin for a lady to cut her hair or change the color of her hair. There would be some seasoned, grounded saints in the church that would say, you're crazy. And they would, they may even be respectful about it, but they are not going to obey me over God. But then there would be another group of people. And I could almost tell you who they would be that would say, oh, wait a minute. Okay. We got a standard here. We have a gripe. We better all start conforming. And that leaven, that influence would begin to spread like wildfire, even in our church. And you guys know our church is a Bible-based church. But even in our church, those kinds of things are contagious. Yeah, it's that addiction we talked about a couple of podcasts ago. Well, and it's it spreads. You know, one of the biggest uh, things that reminds me of, you know, allowing grace to do its thing is um, I remember when we went to community for a service and they had a girl up there that had just shaved her head bald. Yeah. And I was bo- I was I legitimately well. bothered by that because the Bible does talk about a woman, you know, having hair and having a head covering. And I was like, I thought about it and I I remember even talking to you about it. And, and then Brother Stansel ended up talking to you and he told you she actually had just shaved her head right before she got saved. Which was like two weeks earlier. Yeah, yeah. which was so like two hair, weeks earlier. Her hair was like, like Marine Corps, you know, GI shaved down. There was almost no hair up there at all. You know, so Brent, you know, my friend, he comes to me and he says, hey, I just want to tell you, you know, I know you probably noticed this girl up here. And I said, that's none of my business. I just told him. He said, yeah, I know. I know. I understand. But I just want to. And I said, no, 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 none of my business, man. She's your church member. Her level of sanctification is not my responsibility. You put her on the platform uh, because apparently there's a backstory that I don't know. And so it would be juvenile and ridiculous for me to walk into one service and judge this church based on one person who is standing on the platform and he said well he hugged me and he said i i really appreciate you he said i really appreciate you being you know mature about this he said but i do want you to know she just got saved like two weeks ago and i said hallelujah brother mm-hmm. and now didn't she hallelujah. marry one of the stancil sons? she married one of the stancil sons and exactly. she has long hair again yeah and, and she's like, gorgeous i mean she's a beautiful young lady so yeah i mean we you know we we come in i had this preacher one time he told me he said i don't know what i'm gonna preach on until i get there I'm boasting about that and i'm like what are you talking about what do you mean by that and he said well i gotta get there and see what everybody's wearing and I got to get there and see what everybody's driving, see what everybody's playing on the radio when they're driving <laughs> up in the... I'm like, what, man? What kind of... Pre- that's not even preaching. Yeah. You know? That's not even preaching, you know, but this is chumming the waters, uh, you know, the kind of stuff that uh, is a huge problem, you know. So one more verse really quick. We're almost out of time. Verse 10, I have confidence in you. Man, that's, that's great because... Um, I mean, he knew that Jesus had started a work in them, and he knew that what the Lord starts, he's faithful to complete. So Paul says in chapter 5, verse number 10, I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. So he says, uh, I'm confident that you're a born-again Christian, and born-again Christians sooner or later grow up. Mm -hmm. They get past all of this leaven and uh, all of this persuasion. He calls it in verse number 8, the hindrances, verse number 7. And he says, sooner or later, you're going to get past all this. I have confidence. I'll be patient. I have time to wait and watch. Yep. Yep. Well, that was a good episode, guys. Uh, we'll close it here. Uh, we thank you guys for listening. Uh, it really does seriously mean a lot that you guys do listen to our podcast. We aren't doing this to be famous. We aren't doing this for money. Uh, we're doing this because we love God's word. Um, we So we do appreciate the numbers continues to grow. I got to say something real quick, though. There's 38% of you guys that aren't subscribed, right? It's, that must mean either you're lost or you don't care about Jesus. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, or you're a Judaizer. So subscribe, give us a like, leave a comment. Um, we have th- stuff on YouTube. We have stuff all over the internet, Apple. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and good other ones. Um, come visit our church. We've got great, got a great pastor and somewhat of a great congregation, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. But definitely come find, find us, uh, Brandon Baptist Tabernacle. Go check out our website. Tons of sermons on there. Tons of good reading materials on there as well. So uh, we do thank you for listening, guys. Thanks.